concerns and, and uh, answer some questions. Congressman Royce is serving his uh, ninth term in the 40th uh, Congressional District. Um, he's consented to be here. Actually, he's, he does a lot of outreach because he wants to ensure that people are aware of what's going on and have the ability and the opportunity to answer questions. And with that, I'm going to introduce him, and then he's going to get up here. And I would appreciate it if um, we ask. I think the time before we probably had 50 people. So there's much more interest. And so uh, this morning, we discussed this, and we said we, we'd better move this out because we're not all going to fit in Kelly's coffee uh, this time. But with that said, let me make a few observations. And then what I want to do is to go to your questions or your comments so that we can hear from each of you. And what I'd also like to do is ask everybody to be polite. You're not going to disagree with, with every perspective that every person here has. But everybody's got a right to be heard. That's part of the process. You know, town halls have a very long historical tradition in this country, going back to those who were the architects of this republic. And it is a way for people to be heard, frankly. And it's an also a way to share information. So let, let me just begin by a, a few observations on my part. The first would be that the issue that I think brings most of us here, based upon the signs that I see in front of me, is, is uh, health care. And so what I want to talk a little bit about are the questions about how we reform health care going forward. And the divide that sort of separates us on whether we want to do that by changing the existing or reforming the existing system or whether we want to do that by supplanting the existing health care system with an end goal of a single payer system which 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 some people think should be uh, an advantage or could be an advantage over the existing system uh, and um, I'm just going to make some observations about some of the differences between the U.S. system and systems that have ended up with a government-controlled health care program. One of those observations would be we do spend more on health care here in the United States than they do in the EU or they do in the U.K. But there is a trade-off in terms of that. Now, there are things that we could do, frankly, that would drive down the costs. In my view, one of those is, is tort reform. But that's, I think tort reform would, but th there are a number of steps that we could take that would drive down costs. Another would be allowing small businesses to say, have the same rights right now that big businesses have in terms of forming together and allow health associations, which then could bargain for those lower rates for their members, whether it's small business or, or any other association, so that we could bring costs down. I think, I think there's a general concurrence that we need to address pre-existing conditions, you know, health conditions, and figure out a solution to that within the existing system. On the other hand, there is the perspective or there is the argument that if we move towards a single-payer system, you know, that we can have that, that we can achieve results that would bring down costs and increase coverage. Now, that's the, the perspective. And, and uh, Barney Frank the, the other day said, you know, well, oh, hold on, hold on here, hold on here. But, but his comment was that, you know, if, if the goal is, is single payer, the best way and the only way to get there is through this federal option for insurance. Now, I'm, I'm going to share some of the concerns that people have with the idea of a federal option for insurance, starting with a study by the actuaries, the Lewin Group, that do this for a living, that they, the, the Lewin Group for years, and it's not just the Lewin Group, it is other actuarial groups that have looked at the consequences, as well as many of the advocates who believe that at the end of the day, if you have a subsidized health insurance program by the government that's competing with private insurance, that because of the subsidy, companies are going to say, and they say, you know, as many as 70% eventually will say, why not 
just have the employees go with the government subsidized option rather than go with uh, the, the current private insurance and you'll begin to, to see the government program expand at the expense of the private market. Now this is what happened with the government sponsored enterprises uh, when, when the GSEs, if you'll recall, and, and Barney Frank again was the architect of a policy to set up government sponsored enterprises with respect to mortgage backed securities. They ended up being the duopoly and dominating the market. They became a monopoly and as the government subsidized them, right, with their line of credit to the, to the government, the consequence of that was that they forced their competitors out of business. We ended up with, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and then the government was able to control those programs, right? And, and one of the things they did with the, with the program, once it was a government program, now we can make sure that everybody uh, can own a home because we'll tell them that half of their portfolio will allow them to arbitrage and build up these big portfolios of loans. They'll borrow and then they'll, they'll have a portfolio of subprime loans. Half of the loans will be subprime, and they ended up, out of their 1.5 trillion, half of those were subprime and Alte loans because of a mandate from Congress. So once Congress gets involved, once you have government involvement in a government-sponsored enterprise, the government will start to direct that institution. And at that point, you'd better hope the government knows what it's doing. Because if it, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, you could end up for example, losing a trillion dollars in the mortgage-backed security mount market and, and tanking real estate. And that's one of the side effects of creating this kind of government intervention. You, you have, there is, as the economist Hayek said at times, a fatal conceit uh, in terms of believing that you can figure out outcomes better than the market. Now, the concern that a lot of people have right now about the plan that is proposed in the House is the affordability of that plan in terms of it driving the cost curve up instead of down in terms of insurance. And this is the Congressional Budget Office's worry, that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we add to the deficit, a deficit that right now is over one and a half trillion dollars a year. If we add to that the additional bill going forward, if it works out the way the Congressional Budget Office believes it'll work out, then we have compounded our problem. And it is a problem that really vexes the Chairman of the Federal Reserve right now, who worries that because he's got to find a way of getting one and a half trillion of Treasury bills, of one and a half trillion in Treasury bills out there, He's got to find somebody that's going to take those Treasury bills because if they don't this year, then we could have our Treasuries downgraded by the credit rating agencies. And if that happened, it would really be a disaster. So, you know, he, what he's saying is that these deficits are not sustainable, that we have to address this, and this compounds the problem. The Congressional Budget Office Director is saying, CBO is saying, this will compound the deficit situation. And so, this is the other great concern about the costs. Now, one of the debates going on about the bill has to do with Section 245 of the bill, a section which says that you will verify your income in order to see how much of a government subsidy. And as many of you know, there was an attempt to amend that section to also have a verification of citizenship. Because if you don't verify citizenship, it's not just the existing costs that you would have in terms of covering people that are here illegally. It is the fact that around the world, people would know that if they came to the U.S. and got on these government programs, which already there's very little checking, but it, with, without, without amending Section 245, which lost in committee on a straight party line vote, then you've got the, the added problem of the future costs of people coming to the country and, and enrolling in the program. So these are, these are some of the questions, there's many others, but I'm going to open it up now to your questions. If you raise your hand, we'll just kind of move back and forth from left to right.